Hi everyone, welcome to the webinar. Uh, just going to wait 30 more seconds until some extra people join who are just leaving other meetings and then we'll start. Okay, thank you everyone for joining today's webinar on the new theory of knowledge for IB. Uh, before we begin, just have a few housekeeping things to talk about. You can change the slide, Rick. Yeah. So if you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into your questions box, which should be on your GoToWebinar toolbar. Uh, we will be answering these questions at the end of the session, so please put them in to be answered later on. Also, I've had some people asking whether this session will be recorded. Yes, it's being recorded, so we will be sending around a link to that recording after the end of the session. And with that, I'll hand over to our presenter for today, Rick Sims. Sorry, Rick, I just, you, I just had to unmute you. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. So, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Rick Sims. Um, this is a webinar on the new program in uh, TOK with reference to the new book by Pearson. Um, I've been involved in TOK for um, the best part of three decades uh, as a teacher, uh, as a um, uh, an examiner, a senior examiner, I was a deputy chief examiner for a while, uh, a curriculum designer and a workshop leader. And over the next hour or so, I'd, I'd like to discuss uh, some of the aspects of the new program and show how the new Pearson TOK textbook, um, written specifically uh, for this course, um, can support your teaching and uh, help you develop um, a good program in your schools. I'm just trying to change a slide at the same time. It's not quite like, there we go. Um, I want to say a little bit about the author team. I think, I think it's fair to say that this is perhaps the, the most experienced author team of any textbook uh, in the market at the moment. We have Sue Bastian, who was, when I first started TOK, in the 1990s, uh, she was chief assessor, and when I first joined the senior team at the end of the 1990s, she was leading the curriculum review then. We also have Julian Kitchen, um, who until recently was chief assessor for TOK, uh, and Julian and myself have been involved in the last four curriculum review cycles, so 1999, 2006, 2013, and the most current one. So the what you'll be hearing today is a little bit from the inside. Um, our experiences in the um, curriculum review team are reflected in the book and in some of the things I'll be saying today. Uh, I think it's also fair to say that Julie and I are, are perhaps the only members of the team who've been uh, there for every meeting of the current cycle. Um, so let's get started. And I think the best thing is to, to have a look at what our aims are. So we're going to have a look at what the changes are. Um, I'm going to assume that you are familiar with the current program in TOK. Uh, we'll have a look at how the Pearson textbook can support you, um, support your students and build an effective TOK program at your school. So here we have a graphic showing the new program. So there are five major elements to it, as you can see, and the, the time in brackets is the recommended time that you spend on each part of the program. So we have core theme, um, which is knowledge and the knower. 
optional themes, of which there are five, areas of knowledge, of which there are five, the essay task, which should be familiar to you, uh, and a new exhibition task. And you'll notice immediately from this graphic that areas of knowledge take up half of the allotted 100 hours of TOK. That's really important because it's easy to get very enthusiastic about the new elements to the program, the core theme and the optional themes and the exhibition, and um, allocate disproportionate amount of time to them. Keep at the back of your minds when you're designing your program that two thirds of the marks uh, are assessing the essay, which is of course itself assessing areas of knowledge. So um, let's have a look at the new, the new course. You'll see that um, the book is organized uh, according to the, the, the elements of the new course. So we start off with a core theme, knowledge and the knower. There are the five optional themes. Uh, remember that you only have to choose two of those. Um, at workshops recently, um, teachers have asked me, well, you know, should I teach all five? Um, my answer to that would be probably no, because in terms of time, uh, it would be taking time away from, from other things. Concentrate your firepower on two. And uh, again, the interesting question is, how do you choose those two? It depends very much on your local circumstances. Uh, if you have um, a big TOK department with many teachers, you might want uh, to allow teachers to choose their own. But if you have just one teacher, obviously, you know, uh, that's the choice that's made for the whole school. Then we have uh, a chapter devoted to the exhibition, um, which is the new assessment um, item, which I'll say something more, more about that later. Five areas of knowledge, um, natural sciences, human sciences, mathematics, history, and the arts. Those are all compulsory now. There are no options there. And that has implications for the sort of questions you might be uh, uh, encountering when it comes to the essay task. And then the final chapter in the book is uh, on the essay, how to develop the essay, and also how to um, assess it. So here we have the, a graphic showing the new program. Um, if, you, if you look at the, uh, um, the colors here, th those that are in red are new. And you can see that we've got a core theme, um, optional themes, exhibition task are new elements. Um, it's fair to say that there are some alterations with the essay task very minor ones, and I won't spend very much time on that now, but simply the assessment instrument has been streamlined. And I think there's some clarity, a bit more clarity uh, regarding what's expected of that task. So we might want to think a little bit more about why we've done these changes. I mean, are the, you know, the, the, the seven year curriculum review cycle in the TOK in, in, in the IB generally is a very interesting um, process in which every subject becomes re renewed. Um, and I think it's fair to say that in TOK, we've continued some of the themes that were present in the last uh, curriculum review. And I think if I were to pick out five major um, sources of motivation for the changes, there will be things like that we want to, in this uh, curriculum, we're highlighting the material of knowledge, materiality of knowledge. So the knowledge is not just something that's inside the head in a sort of Lockean way, but rather knowledge uh, spreads out there in the world. And then we have tools for making knowledge. We use knowledge to make our lives, our everyday lives better in some way, to make things easier. Um, and most of our knowledge is not actually in the head at all, but we, we, we use other sources to, to engage with it. Um, and I think that's uh, reflected particularly in the exhibition task, where we select three objects, or the students select three objects, which are supposed to clarify or cast light on a knowledge question in the form of a prompt. Um, we're also continuing the theme of the social context of knowledge. Again, that was a, a, 
something that was introduced in the last curriculum review, um, many, perhaps many people didn't realize quite how sweeping the changes were in the last curriculum review. And one of the big changes was concentrating more on social aspects of knowledge. Um, we're also underlining the link between knowledge and responsibility through the ethics part of the knowledge framework. Um, this is, as I will say in a moment, ethics should be thought of not as a system of knowledge here, but rather in its um, connection with knowledge, um, and in particular, making knowledge, acquiring knowledge, using knowledge to do things. And perhaps that's best ex uh, expressed in terms of responsibility. We give a space to discuss knowledge, informal knowledge systems, and that will be things such as, you know, the cultural knowledge, the knowledge that's around us in our everyday lives, uh, and so on. A lot of students wanted to bring Trump into their essays and they found it very difficult to do so. And quite often they shoehorned Trump in as either part of history or as part of the social sciences, neither of which really was very satisfactory. Now the students have plenty of opportunity to discuss Trump as much as they like. Um, and we're also focusing attention on the distinction between contestable and uncontestable knowledge. It's often, uh, it's a misapprehension, I think, that, that in TOK everything is up for grabs that when one is able to discuss anything, everything is um, everything is questioned. I think that's wrong. I think you know there are some uh, there's some knowledge that is just simply not contestable, and there's it's a waste of time even thinking about contesting it. Um, and I think the the skill at working out the difference between what is contestable and what is uncontestable is the important item in TOK. So we want students to think about that and to think about what criteria they might apply to working out what is contestable and what is not. Um, this slide just simply shows the, all the changes at a glance. And since these slides will be available to you after the, um, after the session, I'm, I've included that just really for your, for your benefit. Um, I think I'll move on. So let's start off with knowledge questions. Knowledge questions have always really been a central part of the course. They have been called many things in the past. They've been called problems of knowledge. They've been called knowledge issues. Um, essentially, it's been the same thing. We've tried different names for them simply because um, each name that you choose usually has some disadvantage. Calling it knowledge issues is, was, was a problem in the past because not everybody knew what an issue was. Calling it problems of knowledge made it sound very negative. Um, we just stick with knowledge questions. That was, an, uh, that was the, the name that was decided in the previous curriculum review. And basically knowledge questions are, they have three major aspects. You know, they're about knowledge. And that word about is, um, is really important. About knowledge means that they are second order questions. Yeah? It means that the target of TOK is not things that go out in the world. The target of TOK is knowledge itself. So in TOK, we're discussing knowledge rather than uh, things in the world. Of course, we will discuss uh, items in the world as part of knowledge, but knowledge is our main focus. And sometimes that's lost, I have to say, in read, when I read TOK essays. Um, it's contestable, a knowledge question, it's possible to answer, uh, argue both sides. Um, there's more than one side to it. And uh, the, the last one is that you can express it in TOK terms using TOK concepts. And this is important because um, TOK concepts are slightly abstract because they're intended to link different concrete things. So a knowledge question is, is necessarily going to have some abstract component to it. Now, I'm going to say that although this looks different, this is actually no different from what knowledge questions have been before. There's no substantial difference here. We're just trying to streamline the definition uh, so that more people can have access to them. And the knowledge framework, which was introduced in the last curriculum review and uh, turned out to be very popular, in the last review, in, uh, so the current guide, um, knowledge framework was an optional tool. Um, but we realized that, you know, increasingly it would be helpful if it were actually made more central to the course. So this time round, it's been made compulsory, uh, a, a compulsory or required part of the course. 
in the sense that teachers and students are required to cover these four different elements, scope, perspective, uh, methods and tools and ethics. I'll just quickly go through them because they, they, the knowledge framework can be used uh, in a multitude of different ways, but one way is as an organizing tool, or an organizing device for um, a, the whole unit, if you want. You know, you can imagine um, organizing a unit along the lines of you start off with a scope, then you look at perspectives, then you look at the methods, then you look at the ethical side. Um, but you can also use it to, to scope individual lessons. Uh, you can organize it to use it to organize um, student writing um, projects, and it can even be used to organize the essay. You'll notice that we, we actually use the knowledge framework to organize our book. I shall come to that in a moment. So what is scope? Scope is, is I think, what it, it, it takes into account the sort of things that we had under the previous knowledge framework, scope and applications. So exploring the nature and the scope of the themes and the areas of knowledge. I should say, sorry, I should say at this point that the knowledge framework applies not just to areas of knowledge, but it applies to the themes, so the, the core theme and the optional themes. So it's it's something that goes across the whole course. It's a, uh, in that sense, it's it can be used as a sort of organizing principle. So if you're looking at an area of knowledge, what is the area of knowledge about? You know, imagine the first imagine the first lesson in a higher level subject in the, in the IB course, first le lesson economics. One of the questions you might ask the students is, well, you know, what is economics about? And I expect an answer along the lines of something like, well, it's to do with resource allocation and so on and so forth. You know, in biology class, what is biology about? We'd expect an answer that involves uh, living things or living organisms and so on. So understanding the scope of an area of knowledge or a scope of a theme uh, is extremely important. Then a new element, perspectives. I say new, but again, perspectives has been part of TOK since the year dot. Perspectives is a really essential notion in TOK. And, you know, we are, the starting point for TOK is that, look, human beings have different perspectives on the world and that they look at the world in slightly different ways. And by the way, there's no privileged perspective. And, you know, that, I think that's a really important um, starting point. Now, some perspectives might be more in accord with, you know, evidence than others. But I think we've got to be very careful in thinking there is just one way of looking at things. And this fits, of course, in with the IB mission statement. Um, again, perspectives, I think, should be thought of as a, a sort of systematic uh, worldview. The Germans have this wonderful word, Weltanschauung, which I think is, a, a, for me, encapsulates the idea of perspective. I think perspective is not uh, something like, you know, I, I have a particular opinion on something and you have a different opinion. I think it's more systematic than that. It's to, to do with the, who I am, perhaps, and the various groups that I belong to, you know, I belong to various knowledge communities um, and so on and so forth. Um, so perspectives look at the context. Um, we reflect on you know, the origins of the student's own um, points of view, um, the different knowledge communities that they belong to. And then, of course, this is where um, historical development comes in as well, because historical development um, does lead to the development of a perspective. Methods and tools is, of course, um, a major and central part of TOK, looking at how do we actually make knowledge? And what is it about what we do that makes knowledge? And in the previous program, this would have been put in terms of ways of knowing. Um, ways of knowing are now not part of the new program. They're subsumed here in the knowledge framework. Um, but the words, you know, that we use in the ways of knowing, you know, sense perception and so on, are not now keywords in TOK. So there won't be any essay questions using those words. Now, I, I understand that this might be uh, um, problematic for some teachers and students um, because, you know, ways of knowing were, um, were very widely used. But we found over the years that they were problematic as well. They tended to lead students uh, into the wrong place. 
One of the reasons for that is that they were tend there was a tendency to think of ways of knowing as being the end of the conversation rather than the beginning of it. So when students got to a way of knowing, they thought, right, okay, I've got a way of knowing, this must be knowledge. And unfortunately, that doesn't follow. Ways of knowing were neither necessary conditions for knowledge nor sufficient conditions. It's how you use the ways of knowing uh, that makes knowledge or not. You can use ways of knowing and the end product is not knowledge. It depends how you use them. And that's best summarized as methodology. Yeah, so the methods of an area of knowledge rather than the fact that it's got certain ingredients in it like sense perception. Um, so in the last program, you know, the knowledge framework sort of started to suggest that, that, you know, we use ways of knowing are used together in organized ways. And that is uh, how we produce knowledge. And those organized ways are called methods. And then ethics, um, this is, Again, we had ethics as an area of knowledge in the in the current program. Um, it was felt that ethics was so important that it shouldn't be, you know, uh, left to be uh, an optional area of knowledge. Rather, that it should be part of every student's thinking in TOK. And this is not just ethics as any old ethics. And again, this is a misapprehension that has led to numbers of presentations being uh, being marked down, of course, over the years. Um, just because something's an ethical problem doesn't mean to say it's anything to do with TOK. Ethics in TOK is about the ethics of knowledge production, the ethics of knowledge use, um, and the ethics of using knowledge to make applications in the world to help us live better, better lives. So ethics in TOK is tied to knowledge. That's really essential. And I think it's best couched in terms of responsibility. As I said before, responsibility of the produce and use of knowledge. What are those responsibilities? Um, do I have responsibilities for knowing certain things? Do I have responsibilities if I know certain things given my knowledge? And so on. Um, this is a diagram just showing how the old knowledge framework maps into the new one. Um, you can have a look at this at your leisure, but you can see that scope and applications probably um, maps into scope obviously, but also into ethics. Notice that historical development has disappeared, and I think that's a shame in a way, because I think you know, where we are now in terms of our knowledge does depend on where we were before. And I think that the, the history of, of our, our school subjects, for example, um, is neglected a little bit within the school, and it's something that we should look very carefully at. Um, I'm, I'm a bit geeky. I like going around secondhand book, bookstores and, and buying old school textbooks. And it's really interesting to see to compare an old school textbook with, for example, the, the modern textbooks. I got hold of a, um, a history book um, published in Sweden in, in 1941. It's really interesting to see what Swedish school students were learning as history in 1941. I also have a book in my in my possession that used to belong to my grandfather from the turn of the century, uh, what they were what they were learning in physics. You can imagine that looks really quite different to a modern physics textbook. And I think it should be a wake-up call to us, uh, induce a little bit of humility. Um, at that time, you know, in the 1900s, early 19, no, 1905, there was a feeling that, okay, you know, we, we knew pretty much what physics was and we knew how the world was. And then if you look at that book, how much of that now has been thrown away in a modern textbook? And we just have to think, well, that, that same consideration might apply to our modern textbooks, so much of what we learn today might actually be thrown away in 50 years time or 100 years time. Knowledge is moving all the time, it's regenerative, it's, uh, it's developing. And I think that idea is really important in TOK so that we don't, the students don't think it's a sort of static thing that just sits there, um, things inscribed in stone, but rather it's a human made, um, um, human made developing, evolving thing. So I've said um, that our chapters are arranged according to the knowledge framework. You can see here, I've taken little screenshots from different parts of the book. Um, these little symbols in red are in the margin, that well, you can see that, but these are in the margin that they, they're indicating um, that, for example, the, the little magnifying glass there indicates that we've got scope being dealt with. The eye symbol shows that we're looking at perspectives. Um, the, little tool symbol shows that we're talking about methods and tools and then the, the person 
uh, icon means that we're, look, we're talking about ethics. So the book is organized, um, the area of knowledge chapters are, are organized very strictly using the uh, knowledge framework. And that should help you, I think, in designing your classes, but also help the students in um, navigating their way through these, through these chapters. I, I think I, I'll go through this very, very quickly, just um, because I want to just move on a bit. But if we have a look at um, each of these parts of the knowledge framework, you can see that each part of the knowledge framework uh, is, is set up with some generic knowledge questions, and these are in the guide. Um, I think I might have improved on some of those in the guide, but most of these are, are taken from the guide. Um, and that's another function of the knowledge framework, is that it organizes knowledge questions and puts them in uh, categories, which you can then use to ask uh, relative to a, an area of knowledge or relative to a theme or relative to the core theme. So we've got questions also for perspectives here. Um, you know, how is the current theme AOK -okay shaped by its historical development? We talked about that. Are some types of knowledge less open to interpretation than others? And so on and so forth. You can find these questions uh, in the guide. In the book, we, we do include quite a, a lot of knowledge questions that are taken from the guide. But I think it's fair to say that we also add our own. Um, because the guide has to be a fairly a slim volume and we're able to, in the book form, um, include more knowledge questions. So you, you have a cornucopia of knowledge questions to draw upon um, in the book. Here we have methods and tools. Again, you know, this is completely familiar to you, I think, what assumptions underlie methods of inquiry used in these areas or in these themes. Um, <laughs> really important, actually, process in TOK is looking for assumptions. Most of them are, are, are often hidden. And I think it's, you know, if we're thinking about what processes we want students to be able to do in TOK, looking for hidden assumptions is definitely one of them. And then ethics. Um, and I've, I've thought a lot about the ethical side of TOK. I mean, in the, in the previous curriculum, we, we were th perhaps thinking about ethics coming in in terms of the scope of a, an area of knowledge. You know, what questions are ethical to ask? Is, is a good question, for example. Um, and, and also, of course, in the methodology, what methods are ethical to use in, in producing knowledge? So again, have a look at these questions uh, at your leisure and think about how you're going to use them to, to shape your course. A new thing in the new course is the concepts. Um, concepts, again, have always been played an important part in TOK. And the rest of the IB has sort of come around to a TOK way of thinking in, in adopting conceptual learning as a, as a major educational philosophy. Um, but TOK is conceptual because it's trying to make connections between things. And when you're making connections between things, you need some sort of abstract notion to hang those ideas on. There are 12 concepts, the ones in blue here, that are picked out as being particularly important in TOK. But I, I really want to... In, um, emphasize that those 12 are not the only ones. So in TOK, you can expect lots of other concepts um, to be, to be uh, important as well. And so I would be very unhappy if you were to just concentrate on the 12 and ignore, for example, understanding. You know, understanding is surely a really deep, important idea in TOK, but it's not one of the 12. So what I've done here is made a graphic of the 12 plus some other um, concepts that you'll find in the subject guide, but are not picked out in the same way. Um, models, experiments, observation, uh, inference, another one, really important idea in TOK. I've included material culture because, you know, the, the, the sort of move turned towards material, um, the material aspects of knowledge. Metaphor, I think, you know, in some sense, knowledge itself is a metaphor. Um, paradigm, a lot, of, a lot of teachers I know like to, to do paradigm shifts in TOK and so on. And cultural knowledge. Cultural knowledge underlies these new themes. So I think that's an important concept as well. Uh, again, you know, feel free to use this graphic as you as you wish. Um, those key concepts you'll see are, are highlighted in the book. So, uh, if you look on the, the, the left hand side here, we've got a, a, an information box about a concept. Uh, and on the right hand side, uh, classifying and taxonomy. These are concepts uh, in the natural sciences and really important ones. 
the book is is emphasizing the conceptual nature of TOK. The core theme um, is new, and it, if you like, this is the part of TOK that's dealing with personal knowledge. We don't have the personal shared distinction in the, in the same sort of uh, prominence in the new program as it was in the previous one, but it's sort of in there. And so the core theme asks these important questions like, you know, what personal attributes are useful for me as a knower? Uh, what resources do I need to navigate the social world or the world? What shapes my perspective? Um, how do I make this distinction between contestable and uncontestable knowledge? How should I respond to the knowledge of others? I think this is really important. Um, I'm going to say a little bit more about this because I think it's um, an important feature of the core theme and, and somebody asked a question actually about this. Um, to what extent can we use existing materials for the core theme? I think you can. You can use some of the things you've been doing, you know, you've been using uh, ways of knowing. Some of those methods might work well for the core theme. But I think there's something else here which I think we've neglected in TOK, which is the sort of attributes we might want to have as knowers and also how we should treat the knowledge of others. Um, I'll leave that for one moment and come back to it. And then, of course, how is my knowledge shaped by various knowledge communities to which I belong? You know, I might belong to, you know, a particular class. Uh, I might have a particular education. I might also have a particular political stance, a particular religious stance, and so on and so forth. So those things uh, all influence my my personal knowledge, um, and have affect my perspective. Yeah, I said I'd come back to this. So. I call them epistemic virtues. I mean, that's the sort of official philosophical term for it. But it's sort of like a, an alternative learner profile, but for knowledge. And those of you who know me know that I've, I've pushed this at various points uh, in meetings and in workshops. Um, you can think of these personal virtues that are going to be helpful in making knowledge. So open-mindedness, I think that probably, you know, you can you can see that that belongs to the learner profile, but intellectual carefulness doesn't, and and you'd expect that, wouldn't you? You want to be intellectually careful, careful with evidence, using evidence carefully, um, being thorough, being impartial, having intellectual courage. I think that's what's meant by risk taking, um, perseverance. So not just giving up at the first obstacle, and then intellectual autonomy. So this would be something like you know. Um, being uh, not being so heavily influenced by fads or fashions in, uh, in intellectual life, um, but thinking for yourself and standing on your own two feet. But then you have these social virtues, uh, epistemic fairness, so treating treating the knowledge of others in a fair way. Um, how many times have you been in a meeting when a man is speaking and uh, everybody's paying attention, then a woman speaks, and suddenly people start shuffling their papers, they start gazing out the window and looking at their phones. We could say that's epistemically unfair. That's not treating other people's knowledge seriously. Um, credibility, authoritativeness, you know, these are all um, social virtues. Trust, I think also. So it's a balance, isn't it, between trust and a certain amount of skepticism. Intellectual humility. Um, so basically ownership of your own intellectual limitations and realizing where they are, um, cooperating, producing knowledge together, and then intellectual non-interference. This is one of my favorites, actually, uh, because I think teachers are particularly bad at this sometimes. Not interfering in the knowledge-making processes of other people. Um, so this, so many times I've seen the teacher set some group work, and I have to say I do this myself, and you get the students to do work, work in groups, and then what's the teacher do? Immediately starts interfering with one or other of the groups. Again, no, maybe the students have, should have a space in which they can make their own knowledge without the teacher's interference at that point. Um, the optional themes, you've got to choose two of these. These, uh, of course, we, we give them separate chapters in the book. Each of these is a quite a substantial chapter. Um, don't be put off by the numbering. You know, 2.1 doesn't mean just part of a chapter. That is a whole chapter of uh, 30 or 40 pages, and and each of the optional themes is being is treated very carefully in the book. Um, this is what they look like. So this is one of Julian's chapters on in knowledge and in indigenous societies, and you can see how they're structured. In each of these chapters, we pretend that we're doing the exhibition and we choose an object to concentrate on. 
uh, sort of three objects to concentrate on and uh, make links between them and so on, as exactly as a student would be expected to do in the in the exhibition. So this these chapters are organised in that way, um, but also using the knowledge framework. Let's talk about the exhibition um, because this is new, and I'm sure a lot of you have lots of interesting um, ideas about this. We tried out the exhibition, we've, we've piloted it uh, three times actually, and the students that we tried the exhibition out with were very, very excited about it. They were very enthusiastic, um, and I think it, you know, I think you'll, you're going to enjoy doing the exhibition. I think your students are going to really enjoy it. It reduces your, um, it reduces the footprint of this assessment component compared to the presentation. If you imagine, you know, I had classes of 30. Um, and if they were 15 presentations that you know each one took half an hour or so including questions and setting up that's you know seven and a half hours of your 100 hours already just gone with presentations and that's not including all the preparation work that you do and um, looking at their uh, drafts and so on so i think since the exhibition can be done in one in one go it's going to be very exciting and it will reduce the the, the footprint it also gives the possibility of inviting uh, parents, um, high ups in the school, students who are lower down in the school to come and see the presentation, uh, to come and see the exhibition and to, um, and to see what the, the TOK students are doing. And this will have an effect of raising the profile of TOK within your school, but also just basically showing off how good your students are. I mean, it's always fun to have, um, to have parents and so on seeing what students are doing. And I think it's all part of the, the school process and the school outreach process so you can sort of make the exhibition as a major major a major part of the of the program the suggestion in the guide is and it's strongly recommended it's not um, required but it's strongly recommended that you do this in year one because you don't need to have, have taught the whole course before they can do the exhibition what does the exhibition involve it involves three objects here you see a graphic from the book um, the students must pick three objects um, that relates to a prompt. Now the prompts, there are 35 of them in the in the subject guide, and those are basically knowledge questions. So you pick a prompt and then you see how you try and choose some objects that illustrate that question. Um, it's quite different from the essay in the sense that you're not expected to answer the question with the objects. And I think it's good to have a heuristic in the back of your mind here we're thinking about an exhibition, say, in a museum. So, you know, I can imagine lots of conversations about what is an object and what is not. The guide, I think, gives you good, um, some good guidance on that. But the heuristic should be something like, are the things that the students are proposing, are they something that could be in a museum? And uh, think about that. It means, basically, that the objects themselves have to be specific. So the objects, it should be possible to write a little plaque on the wall saying this object is such and such, it was found in such and such, or it was made in such and such time, um, it, that each object can be properly attributed. So what won't count and what we won't allow is sort of gen generic images being downloaded from the internet. That, you know, quite often I find my students using generic things from the internet and they're, they're not attributed because there's no author, there's no date, uh, and you know, of course, I ask the students, well, how can you think of that as being a source if you don't even know who the author is and you don't even know the date of when it was when it was actually written? Um, so we we would hope that you can put a timestamp on it somehow, or that the objects are attributable. So I'll give you a sort of a flavor uh, to give you a flavor of this. I'll give you an example of this. So this is this is from the book. This is one of Julian's examples. Um, so he's, he's picked here the first of the, the, the prompt here. That's the most important thing, perhaps, is does some knowledge belong only to particular communities of knowers? He's picked a bottle of iron brew here, the Scottish um, sweet drink. Um, and it turns out that the recipe for this is, is secret. Um, the family that runs the company, only one person actually knows it. It's the chairman of the company. Um, and it's uh, perhaps some, one other person knows it, and then it's the secret recipe is hidden away in a bank vault somewhere. The second object here is, now he says the object is Grigory Perelman, but it'd be very difficult, I think, for a student to bring Grigory Perelman into the exhibition himself. It's probably gonna be a photograph, isn't it, of uh, Grigory Perelman. And again, 
it should be properly attributed, there should be a photographer and a date, the usual thing. And what's interesting about Perelman is he solved a very, a very deep mathematical problem, one of the millennium problems, the thing called the Poincaré conjecture, to do with um, topology of manifolds. And um, he refused the million dollar prize that went with uh, uh, the, the Fields Medal and the Clay Foundation's prize. He just didn't want the money because he said, well, this actually belongs to the mathematical community or to the community that that mathematics belongs to, to the community. And then the final, um, final object was uh, uh, anti-virus pills, um, Antiva, um, and the idea here is, of course, to do with um, generic drugs. This idea of of that certain drugs, because they have massive benefit to humanity, should be available to all, and therefore should not be covered by the usual sort of patent laws. Um, so you can see what's going on here. That prompt is being illustrated by the three objects. Um, I, I've got a lot to say about how um, how you should try and get the objects to do the work rather than the the commentary. In an exhibition, you know, it's the objects that are saying something to you, not the plaque on the wall. So think about that when you mount your exhibition. I made a little graphic here about how those objects linked to various aspects of the prompt. Uh, again, you can look at this um, in your own time. Um, I've done, I made a similar one last night. I, I thought, well, okay, can I make an exhibition out of the objects I have in my room? Again, I've, I'm a musician, so I'm surrounded by musical instruments here. And again, I did something similar, um, made my exhibition of three instruments from different time periods, as you can see. And the, the prompt was, how can we know that current knowledge is an improvement on past knowledge? I gave you a similar graphic, how I, I try and compare each of these instruments and two aspects of the prompt. Again, this is something you can look at on your own. We've done a quite careful analysis in the book of these exhibitions, and that hopefully will be helpful for you and your students. Um, we're getting towards the end now. The essay, there are some <laughs> very small changes in it uh, in terms of streamlining the assessment, but basically the essay remains the same. Uh, perhaps the only difference we're, we're looking at here is that because all the areas of knowledge are now compulsory, it means we can mention them by name in the essay titles, which we've not been allowed to do uh, in the, since the, the, new, the last curriculum came in because they were all optional. We can also, of course, refer to knowledge framework elements because they are also required. So I think the essay task will get easier because of that, because at the moment we've got a big piece of extra work that students have to do, which is to think of areas of knowledge that fit the, the title. And uh, that's extra brain power required and also extra complexity and extra place where students can, can uh, go off track. So final reflections then. Um, you might want to reflect about what sort of things students are doing when they do TOK, all these ing words. Again, I'll let you to let you do think about that on your own. Um, and then think about how the new curriculum um, helps you with you know, these various processes that are happening in TOK. All of these are to be found in the book, of course. And then the sort of higher level ing, talking, I call it, um, applying, using the knowledge framework, forging different types of understanding. Again, these are referred to in the book, as you can see here. Just taking the, Sue's opening chapter in the book, and you can see that these are these are just on one page. You can find all of them. Um, TOK has a very special vocabulary, and again, you see how the book um, scaffolds student learning by making that vocabulary available and unpacking um, vocabulary especially for students who are English as a second language. So uh, that's the end of my sort of formal part. Uh, I now um, hand over to Catherine to ask me some of your questions. Thank you, Rick. Um, so we've had lots of questions. Thank you very much to everybody that submitted a question. I'm just going to go through them in order. Um, so the first one is actually a question I can answer. Is the book available? So we are working on finalising the book at the moment and it should be available, well it will be available in early August. We do have um, a selection of sample chapters and we will send those um, when we send the follow-up email with the recording we will also send a link to the sample chapters so you can get an idea of how the book looks. 
Okay, the second question, this one is definitely for you, Rick. So one of the most common questions that I receive as a TOK teacher is, is TOK not just a philosophy course? How much formal philosophy should be included in the course? Right, so I think that's quite an easy answer as well. Um, how much formal philosophy should be answered in the, uh, uh, included in the course? Uh, none, none should be. Um, is it helpful to be a philosopher to teach the course? I'm not sure. I mean, I think it was Turgenev who talked about, you know, um, every every novelist should be a psychologist, but a secret one, and possibly every TOK teacher should be a philosopher, but a secret one. I find that I occasionally name drop philosophers when it's useful. And of course, philosophy and TOK overlap, but I would not say that TOK and, and philosophy were, were the same course. Um, Part of it is to do with the processes and, and um, the sort of things we do in TOK and philosophy. TOK, I imagine to be a very um, concrete course. You, you, you're dealing with concrete examples, at least that's how I try and teach it, always using concrete examples. My main sort of strategy is to go from the concrete to the abstract and then back to the concrete again. So concrete examples, perhaps then illustrating a concept or getting the students to use the concept and then, of course, I might act, act, um, act like a raison um, a, a provocateur, um, devil's advocate, throw in an example that doesn't fit their nice definition and, and get them thinking that way. But um, in the sense that that's an elenchus, that's a, a type of dialogic um, uh, pro learning process, then, then perhaps philosophy and TOK have something in common there. But I think the methods of TOK are far more concrete than those in philosophy. And I, I, I teach both and um, I find that I'm a, a really different animal in a TOK class than I am in a philosophy class. So the answer is to that, you don't, you don't need to have philosophy training. And perhaps it's a disadvantage if you think that you've got to tell students about um, Plato and Aristotle and so on. I think that's a disadvantage. I think the great thing about TOK is it's a student-centered course. Uh, we're concentrating on the students' own experiences, and we can, those, those own experiences we can use to synthesize the sort of things that we want to do in TOK, uh, without talking about what um, uh, what the great and the good have said. Having said that, I think that's also a misunderstanding of philosophy, because I think philosophy is not thinking about what the great and good have said, but is actually doing some thinking yourself. So it's, in, I don't know whether that's a clear answer, but something like, insofar as TOK and philosophy involve critical thinking, then um, there's overlap but in TOK, you do not need to know any formal philosophy. Thank, Thank you. you. So the next question, um, I think early on in the presentation, you talked about the materiality of knowledge and somebody's asked, yes. please, could you define that? Yeah, okay, so what I'm, what I'm thinking about here, one of the examples we use in the book is um, in the knowledge and technology section, is when I, when I was young, um, in maths classes, we used the slide rule to do calculations. And certain calculations I could not do without using the slide rule. The slide rule is just a piece of plastic with, with certain numbers uh, arranged on it in a logarithmic scale. Um, so what happened is that by using that slide rule, by being connected it in a certain uh, in a certain way and having certain um, abilities with it, I was able to do far more things than um, than before. So that innate that enhanced my cognitive abilities. That slide rule became part of my knowledge machine, if you like. And I think if you look at the history of knowledge, you'll, you'll see that mankind th throughout the millennia has been using physical objects for knowledge purposes. I mean, one can think of language, you know, and the written language in particular as a physical object out there, written a written text as being a, a sort of knowledge object par excellence. You look at the tablets at, at Gnosis. Um, so this is from the Mycenae Empire. Uh, these tablets are actually sort of accounting documents, but the keeper of the tablets was keeping knowledge about the state of the of the empire, in particular the royal palace. Uh, and that knowledge was not in anybody's head, that knowledge was on the tablet. Uh, so I, I think perhaps it's so obvious that we miss it, that a lot of our knowledge is out there in the world. If I want to go to Stockholm, um, now I'm living here in mid-Sweden, I want to go to Stockholm, I don't really have to navigate um, to Stockholm, I just follow the signs. The environment is organized in such a good way that the knowledge is actually out there in the environment. You can see this is a really different knowledge, type of knowledge to the sort of knowledge that you learn in philosophy textbooks, a lot sort of Lockean or Platonic view. This is an idea of you know, knowledge being distributed over people and uh, of things. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Percy has asked, as we have streamlined all difficult terms and past terminologies, such as ways of knowing, um, personal, personal knowledge and shared knowledge, how can we, as TOK teachers, help students to construct knowledge questions or draw connections from objects in real life situations to IA prompts in a TOK world? OK, um, there's two questions there. I'll take the first one. I perhaps didn't say this and certainly didn't say it clearly. So thank you very much, Percy, for bringing it up. But the construction of knowledge questions is not required anymore as a formal part of the assessment in the course. So previously with the presentation, you had to construct a knowledge question um, that came from the real life situation. We've taken that task away for, for a number of reasons. Um, and instead, the prompts are, if you like, they're already knowledge questions. and the students have to be able to exemplify them. So we've, the task has changed from construction to exemplification. And I, I actually, I'm in favor of that because um, firstly, there was a huge amount of um, confusion out there in the TOK world about what a knowledge question actually was. Um, a lot of students um, fell at that first hurdle uh, in the presentation task because they were, choosing a, a question to, to look at, which actually wasn't to do with knowledge, it was a first order question or whatever. So, so that, that's no longer um, required. And if you, I don't know what I can still do this, if you go back to my slide about the, the linking of the objects to the prompt, what I've tried to do here is show that the prompt can be deconstructed very much in the same way as you deconstruct a, a prescribed title for the essay into a series of aspects and then the student's job now is to link their objects to the aspects of the prompt. And I try to uh, model this in, in the examples that I've given you. And you'll find that, you know, for example, in Julian's chapter in the book, he's linking his objects to particular aspects of the prompt. Now that linking is not a knowledge question construction issue, it's more of an exemplification issue. It's still, I think, regard, uh, you know, it's not a dumbing down here. You've still got to do very hard task, which is actually to deconstruct a, a prompt into its parts and then see how the objects relate to each part of the, the prompt. One thing I will say there is that if you notice here um, on Julian's uh, three, three objects here, each object relates to a part of the prompt, right? But none of the objects overlap. Uh, they, they relate to different parts of the prompt. In my objects, I try to make it the other way around just to show you that it could be done, that each object relates to each part of the prompt as I've decomposed it. How a student decomposes the prompt, that's in, entirely up to them, but obviously there's you know constraints, the prompt constrains how you decompose it. But it depends on how you think about the objects as to what aspects of the prompt you want to look at, how you sort of unpack the prompt or how you operationalize it. So it's a sort of circular process. The prompt will inform your objects, but then the objects themselves will lead you back to the prompt and say, OK, I'm going to look at this aspect of the prompt. I hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Nazia, and she says, please, could you elaborate more on knowledge questions as contestable? OK, so the contestability just means that the knowledge question does not have an obvious answer. So a question like, you know, um, is there such a thing as a neutral question? You know, I, I'm already sure, I'm not sure how I'm going to answer it because I can say, well, yes, in one sense, if you word it in certain ways without bias, this horrible word, um, then maybe you've got a neutral question. But on the other hand, as soon as I start using concepts and conceptual language, aren't I just loading the question with, with prior suppositions? So already I can see there are two, um, two branches that I could follow if I was writing an essay on this. Um, and so the contestability is simply that it can, the, the question can be answered in more than one way. And we're interested in that in TOK, of course, because some, I, I suppose all the really important questions in life do have multiple answers. It's just that those answers aren't equally likely. So you, you might want to say, well, which is the most plausible answer to this question? And that, mean, that means students have to in, engage in judgment. And I think judgment is a really important TOK term. Um, and again, it's, it's not one of the official 12 concepts, but I would say it's, it's one that should be dealt with. How do we make judgments and on what basis do we make those judgments? We're making judgments all the time. So it's really to get this idea 
uh, that there's multiple answers, those answers have to be evaluated somehow and we think about how do you evaluate them. Okay, okay. we're running out of time. We've got um, a little bit, we could probably have a couple more questions. Um, yep. So the next question is, should personal and shared knowledge still be central in the teaching, although it's not specifically mentioned in the new guide? Yeah, I think that's up to you, really, how you organise the teaching. Um, as I suggested, the personal shared distinction is sort of built into the structure of the course, because you have the core theme, which is knowledge and the knower. Now, you could say, well, that's very sort of knower-centric in a way. It's looking at the knower as being the centre of the whole thing. And, you know, two reviews back, we had a diagram with the knower at the centre. The problem with that is, of course, it becomes too, sometimes too sort of individual-centric. And, and you know, there's a realisation that knowledge is something that's out there that many people have and communities have. And it may be there are people, there's no one person that has the whole knowledge of a community, but it's something that's distributed amongst them. Um, at the same time, the, that personal view, a person is embedded in society. So you know, knowledge and the knower, that, that core theme is also exploring the links between the knowledge of that of, of the student, let's say, and of course the society around him and or her. And that's, um, so there's a linkage already there with sort of like shared knowledge and personal knowledge. Um, the areas of knowledge quite clearly are shared. And then you've got the optional themes in the middle, you know, knowledge and technology. Well, sometimes that's going to be, a, there's going to be a personal edge to that. Sometimes there's going to be obviously a shared part to it. One of the examples in the book is um, a sat nav, sat satellite navigation system on a car. And quite clearly, you know, that's augmenting my personal knowledge when I'm using that in the car but it's only made possible by a very, very huge systematic um, structuring of the environment, uh, i.e. putting lots of satellites up and having a complex decoding system in the car. So there's a shared part to that as well. So I think it's fair to say that, you know, shared, the shared personal thing is sort of built into the course. What you don't have to do is use those terms, obviously. Um, but I think, you know, understanding that knowledge comes in lots of different flavours and some of those are more individualistic and some of those are more social. I think that's a, an important part of TOK. So I, I anticipate that you can tweak your current teaching there uh, and still satisfy the demands of the programme. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, do one more question. Um, we will make all of the we, we will make a um, FAQ document so any questions that we haven't answered um, Rick and I will create answers for and we will share the answer the questions and the answers when we share the recording of the webinar so just one more question is another one that I can answer so um, other than being available electronically what are the other advantages of the ebook so in the ebook we have some extra downloadable pdfs um, and that will include things like lesson plans especially around um, the theme of ethics and there will also be some um, sample student essays with commentary so your students can kind of get an idea of what a good essay looks like and why it's a good essay so we have run out of time thank you very much to everybody that joined thank you for your questions um, as i say we will answer them uh, we will follow up in an email and thank you very much to rick as well <laughs>